Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by iFixit. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy with step by step repair guides, high quality replacement parts, and all the tools you'll need. For $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, go to ifixit.com slash twit and enter the code knowhow at checkout. And by lynda.com. Learn what you want, when you want, with access to over 2,000 high-quality online courses and training videos, all for one low monthly price. Try it for free for seven days. Visit lynda.com slash knowhow. That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash knowhow. Today, you'll know how to put together a portable podcasting rig. You'll be able to wiretap with Wireshark and more. Oh, hi. Welcome to Know How. I'm Maya Zachter. This is Twit's how-to show. Father Robert is off on special assignment messing with Interop, but he'll be here uh, via the magic of recordings. I'm winded because if you guys watch live, you might have seen me running a lap around the studio chasing Greg Burnett, who had stolen my lunch earlier today. So I'm very, very angry with him. He's also the fine artist of our silly chalkboard gags. <clears throat> Thank you. I have a birthday coming up. I'm getting very, very old. So, this is that. If I didn't mention this, by the way, this is know-how. This is the show we give you those projects you know you like to do, and if we can do it, there's you guys can do it as well. Let's start off today's episode with what's making news. All right. So, what's making the news these days? Well, dig this. There's a new Arduino that's actually Intel powered. Intel's got this new processor called the Quark, and this is going to power an Arduino. Now this seems like overkill. If you ever mess with an Arduino, and we have on know-how, you know that it's relatively underpowered, but this new version of the Arduino called the Galileo board will let you run x86 programs on it. So now you're talking about a lot more power on something as simple as an Arduino. It's just, it's early days, so who knows what we're gonna see coming out of that. I'm super excited. I'm gonna mess with that one day. If somehow my producer could get her hands on the Galileo, you're going to thumbs up off there. So that's what's making the news this time. So let's start off with a project that I wanted to show you guys. A while ago, I showed you guys this idea, or at least I talked about an idea, of a portable podcasting rig. A long time ago, I was a reporter. I'd go to these tech shows, and I was basically a one-man unit when it came to collecting video content, posting it on our blog, all kinds of stuff that way. And I had a lot of different devices. And so what I wanted to do was create one, well, rig that could be the thing to shoot the video on, edit on, and even upload. So I wanted one device that could do everything, and I wanted high quality video, high quality audio, so lots and lots of particular uh, requirements when it comes to that. So the first thing I'm gonna use is an iPhone. Yes, I'm using an iPhone, an iDevice, and there's a good reason why I'm using an iPhone, because there's lots and lots of different options when it comes to video editing options, when it comes to accessories as well. So thankfully, I've been loaned an iPhone, Thanks to Liz at Twit. I'm gonna have to put in her password, excuse me. And now we've got an iPhone right here. So the reason why I went with the iPhone is because there's a lot of accessories. We need a way to get the iPhone onto something like a tripod or a stabilizer. And what we found was something called the M case, or sorry, the M cam light. That's the M cam light. What this thing does, this is a case that's built out of aluminum. And what you do is you place your iPhone into it. It gives you the option of getting a lens a separate lens here, and it actually has a couple of tripod mounts. So there's one spot here, one here. I'm all off. Let me tell you. It's actually got a couple of tripod mounts, one here, one here, and one on the side. So if you want to hold this in a different way, it also has a cold shoe. So if you want to put accessories up there, let's see if you can see it. If you want to put accessories on there, you can do that. So it actually comes with this lens which can be unscrewed. If you want to use your own lenses, you can actually put on other lenses there. I'm gonna put the lens cap on so I don't damage it. It also comes with this case. You gotta put this case on your iPhone for this to work. 
Now, if you look at this, it's not like there's any doors. So you have to put your iPhone in this case, which I will do. It's just a little rubber case. And you're supposed to slide it in this way. Now, if you notice something right now, this big chunk of metal here, there's no option for power. So you better turn on your phone before you put this in here. So we're gonna pop this in. Phone's ready to go. And hopefully I won't break this phone since I'm borrowing it. So now this phone is ready to go when it comes to, let's go to the camera app. So right now I've turned on the camera app and you can actually see through the lens, you can see around the studio, thanks to AirPlay, you can see, oh look, there's our producer Shannon. And then we have a happy waving person, happy waving people. And right now you can see the quality of video as I'm walking around is a little bit shaky, okay? Because, well, it's actually a little bit better thanks to the weight of this grip, but you can see, see this? Now I'm moving in, it's kind of, shaky now when it comes to a device like this that's a good start when it comes to setting up something for your iphone but i wanted a way to get audio into it because right now with this rig by the way the audio is very very muffled but these folks at mcam they actually did come with a little microphone this is the microphone it comes with you can't just plug any microphone into the headphone jack because of the way these things are designed. So you have to need a special microphone. This is the microphone that comes along with it. Now I've tested this out. The quality is all right, and we'll play a sample of the audio quality in a minute. But it comes with this. So if you only want to use this device, just like this, we'll actually be able to shoot video and hear audio. So if I wanted to talk to somebody, do an interview. Let's do an interview right now. All right, so I'm doing an interview. So right now what I'm doing is I'm speaking with the microphone pointed at me, and I can actually turn around and be like, hi there, scared person. How is it going? Great. <laughs> that's Shannon Morris, the spectacular actress herself. And that's the way that thing works. So you can use this microphone if you want. I'm not a big fan of such devices like this. This might be better than the built-in microphone that's in there. And right now, it's, like I said, it's really muffled because of the aluminum. So what I wanted to do was use a shotgun mic because I want to be able to point this device and hear the person over there instead of having that microphone that comes along with it. So what I wanted to do was use an input device. This is an iRig Pre. Now, why are we going with the iRig Pre? This is about $40, and what it is, is it, uh, it actually powers a uh, microphone. So if you need a microphone or use a microphone that uses phantom power, this is the device you want. So if you have an XLR mic, like a shotgun mic, like I happen to have here. This is a shotgun mic. Let me just pop this out of its case. This is a shotgun mic. So whatever you point it at is going to be the audio source. And what I want to do is I want to put it into this container. Now this is a little uh, holder for a shotgun mic. It's made of plastic, a little rubber. You just pop it through. And it, on the bottom here, this is, what a sh this is a, a piece for a shoe. So you put it into the cold shoe. So like I said on the top here, this divot, we're gonna pop this device right into the cold shoe. Now a cold shoe is cold because there's no power to it. If it was a hot shoe, you'd have power. You might see those things on a DSLR, you might see them on regular camcorders. So now we're getting a little bit more ridiculous, right? So now we've got the ability to get this audio into here once I hook up the iRig. Okay, so we got our XLR here. We got our XLR here. We got this thing tipping over. We have this tipping over. All right, good. Let me cover up the lens just in case it doesn't like fall over. Now, when you're using something like this, make sure that you have the phantom power on. We're gonna turn it on to 48 volts. So what happens is if we don't turn this on, we're not gonna get audio. Also, if we don't hook it up, we're not gonna get audio. So we're gonna hook it up. All right, so we've got this here. So now we've got a rig that can actually take in audio this way. Now, granted, it's a little cumbersome right now because I wanted to show you how to put it together. So I don't have everything to tie it together. But lastly, I want a way to walk around and have a stable experience now, in the old days, I built a steady cam out of actual metal pipes. So I spray painted it black and it looks nice and everything. But then I was looking at the cost of it. It was around 40 bucks because you need to have a drill press, all kinds of stuff. And I found a video stabilizer from a company called Revo. It's the ST500. Now this thing costs about 60 bucks. So while it may be a little bit more expensive than a DIY version, it's only 60 bucks. So what it does is it attaches to anything that you could attach a tripod to, including this mount. So this is what it looks like. Let me put this down. Mm -hmm. Okay, go. So this is the Revo. 
Now, just because you buy a video stabilizer doesn't mean that your video is going to be stabilized off the bat. You gotta kinda learn how to use this. On the bottom here are weights, so you can counterbalance your camera. So once we do this, and that'll actually help you have a steady level hand. It won't do it by yourself. So if, you, if you're like a shaky person, it's not gonna be very good. You gotta learn how to use these. So we're gonna attach our camera rig to our stabilizer, the Revo ST500. I'm gonna attach it via this screw on the bottom. Okay. So right now we've got this thing hanging off. I would really love to fix it, but like I was mentioning before, I wanna make sure that we had the ability to show you how to put it together that way. So right now you can see it's tilted the wrong way. So I just need to drop the weight slightly, try to balance it out slowly. You can see it's getting more balanced. So what I want to do is move the camera back. So you fiddle with this until you're happy, right? So can we get the shot of uh, what I'm seeing? All right, so we've got everything hooked up, okay? So the iRig is just kind of seated there. You can see that it's tilting the picture. If we go to the Apple TV, you can see what I'm seeing. So I'm walking around and it's a little smoother. Now, like I mentioned before, just because I'm using this video stabilizer doesn't mean it's gonna be stable. I need to learn to use this. So if I'm running around, let's say CES, and I'm like, hey, I need to interview this guy. So I'm gonna just kind of steady up. It's like, Hi. hey, look, it's Burke. What are you selling today? Nothing. Great, sounds exciting. So we're gonna go over this way. You can see it's a lot smoother than just my hand because that is not as steady. And it's a little shaky right now. So that's the way you can hook this up. Total cost of this, this, this actual case, the MCAM light, was about 130 bucks. You could probably get another thing to hold a tripod, but it's starting to get pretty cumbersome when you have uh, other rigs. So this is kind of nuts, I think. It does look a little silly. Now, I think I was talking to somebody and they're like, this doesn't look professional. If you were walking around CES and you saw somebody shooting with this, they're not gonna think that you're a real big leaguer. That doesn't matter, by the way. When I was a one-person blog guy and I had to go around to these things, the video, the first person to get the video up there was the source for everything. So the fact that I can shoot on this thing, edit on this thing, and upload right from here as I'm going from one booth to the next booth, that actually got me tons of views for things like the PSP Go when that was brand new. So lots of things that way. So never underestimate being first, especially with the news. I want to show you some guys some uh, video samples that we shot earlier using this rig when I wasn't uh, doing it on the fly like this. So let's get to those. Who are you and what do you do, even though I called yeah. you Brian? Hey guys, I'm Brian. I edit. Thanks for asking. I hear you're working on a Raspberry Pi project. Is that true? That is correct, sir. Here it is. Here's a Raspberry Pi inside of an NES case, and here's a Raspberry Pi inside of some wood. And we're going to play some games. Hopefully. Okay, so that was the iPhone by itself naked. I was just using my hand to try this out. You can see what that looks like. Then I tried it with the shotgun mic and our whole rig put together, and this is what that looked like. Uh, because, uh, by the way, if, you're, if you get motion sickness, be careful because this is kind of wavy in the beginning. Now we're at sea. <laughs> <laughs> so stormy sea. All right, so I got to practice. Moving. Who are you and what do you do? I'm Brian Burnett. And at night, I am Batman. <laughs> How's the uh, audio? You got, you got the shotgun into uh, That's cool. The shotgun usually picks it up all right. So in theory, what would happen, mm -hmm. although this audio would be uh, out of whack because we only have one input because my audio is going to be not as good as yours. Right. But like, Brian, you're working on something. Brian, what are you working on? Well, hey, Ayaz, I'm working on stuff on my computer right here that I'm not going to look at because when I turn my head, the audio will be weird. Because <laughs> in theory, we can hook up an XLR wireless path with this. Oh, and yeah. then you're also working on a Raspberry Pi thing, yeah? That I am. If you follow me over here, <laughs> here's my Raspberry Pi. Do some sweep shots. Here it is in wood. Just don't get it too hot. So we shot this the other day and you could see you could hear that the audio was a little hot because of this and one of the downsides about the iRig itself is it does not have uh, you can't hear the audio through it unless you're playing back so it's not like you're getting live audio feedback so if you're wearing headphones you're not going to be able to hear that I did find that to be a downside when it comes to our video production because you want to be able to hear what's going on when you're shooting so unless you're absolutely sure it was working because I know the first couple of times I was trying this I didn't put the right power on I just put the on switch to on and not 48 volts it wasn't powering the microphone. And as you could hear here, the, uh, the actual audio was a little hot because I was kind of close to Brian with the shotgun mic. That can change as you choose different shotgun mics 
We just wanted to see what would happen when we put this together. And you can see that the audio and video, very different than when just using an iPhone alone. Using the iPhone alone, you better have a steady hand because it's really light and it's easy. Anything you do is gonna be seen by that little lens. And some folks have noticed that the brightness looked a little different when it came to using this. Uh, obviously this is being, this phone and lens are behind this lens. So the auto brightness was trying to take care of that. Uh, also, we highly recommend using the YouTube capture app if you're gonna bother doing this because the capture app, you have the option of only shooting in landscape because you don't want to accidentally shoot in portrait because I know a couple of times the phone was like, you're in portrait mode, and that was very irritating. So use the YouTube Capture app, which is free and available at the iOS store. And this would allow me to go into places, once I hook it up properly, and learn my balance, I'd be able to go to different events and be a one-man team. Unless I want to, like I, said, I could do selfies, but I couldn't see myself. It'd just look a little weird. Anyway while I'm talking to this camera. Uh, how about we check in with Father Robert, who's got a quick tip. What do you got? The chances are in this NSA era of spying that you've heard of the term tap, but the chances are equally good that you have thought that you'll never have to know what a tap is or how it works. I'm Father Robert Balliser, the digital Jesuit, here to show you not only why you want to know how a tap works, but why you want to use one. Now, a tap is quite simply a device that goes between two other devices, two other points in your network, and gives you a usable stream of information. These two here are fiber taps. You've seen these on my enterprise show. Now, we're probably not going to be dealing with fiber in your home network, so we're going to set these aside. But it's important to notice that the operation of the fiber taps are essentially the same as the operation of copper taps, which you probably do have in your home. Now, the first way to tap your network is to use something like this. This is a managed switch, and it has the ability to create what's called a span or a mirror port, which is essentially a series of commands that tells the switch to push to one of these ports the traffic that's going to all the other ports. It's really simple to do if you have a managed switch, but it has a few disadvantages. The first is that you have to have a managed switch, and these are crazy expensive. The second is that a span or mirror port is limited to one gigabit. In other words, only one gigabit of data can come out of that port, whereas if it's a 24-port switch, you have 23 ports of two gigabits going and coming, one gigabit going and coming, that could potentially be pushed to that span port, meaning that it will drop packets. Not the best of uh, potentials for tapping. Another way to do it is to use one of these. This is actually a hub. This is where networking started. It's a little more primitive device than a switch because while a switch will direct traffic between one port and another, a hub simply takes in an ethernet frame and it spits it out all the other ports. It's incredibly inefficient, which is why we got rid of it, but that has a side effect, which is it makes a pretty decent tapping device. I can have my devices in here, and since all the traffic gets repeated out all the other ports, if I have a device, say, plugged into port one that's listening, it will hear all the other traffic on my network. The advantage to that is it's really easy to install, and it's cheap. You can get one of these on eBay for 10 bucks. But like the span in the mirror port, it is possible to oversubscribe it, and hubs typically top out at 10 or 100 megabits per second, not the gigabit that we're used to at home. My preferred way to tap is something like this, a dedicated tap. The operation of this device is quite simple. What it looks like to the two devices being tapped is a bump in the wire, nothing more. It's just another piece of copper. It has port A and port B. So you go from device A to device B, and then it has tap A and tap B. What that allows you to do is to pull just the traffic heading in one direction, either incoming or outgoing from your device A or your device B. Where this becomes useful is when you're trying to track down something strange happening on your network. For example, let's say you want to confirm your suspicions that your computer has been owned. And so you want to listen to the outgoing traffic. You want to know if your computer is phoning over to Russia, or you want to know if your computer is sending out sensitive information. That's why you would only listen in on one side, the side going back out to the router. Now, the reason why I tell you all this information is that I hope that you'll go out and get one of these devices because next week I'm going to show you exactly how you can use them in your home network to secure your devices. 
You can either go to eBay and get a hub for about $10 or more likely, hopefully more possibly, you'll go to a site like Hack5, uh, the home of our very own Shannon Morse, where you can get their Ninja Pro for about 40 No matter what you do, next week, I'm going to show you how to use these to turn your network into the secure palace that it deserves to be. I'm Father Robert Balasair, and that is your quick tip. Weird. Great quick tip. I found this on the set. It's uh, Great Scott Gadgets Throwing Star Land Tap Pro. This shouldn't be on the set. Get rid of that. That means there's some tapping going on here on the know-how set or networking underneath. Just make sure it's secure. We'd like to take a quick break and thank our sponsor, iFixit. iFixit has come to know how, and that's like a perfect fit. You guys have probably heard of iFixit. If you ever see a new gadget that's been torn apart, you see the insides, like the new Nexus 7, the old Nexus 7, and on their front page, you can see an iPhone, like an exploded view. iFixit goes out there, tears apart these devices so they can figure out how to repair them. At iFixit, you've probably seen their repair guides, which are free for life, by the way. They're available on Creative Commons licenses, so you can have them all over the web. So they always tell you how to fix stuff, uh, the fantastic repair guides. But they also make tools, if you didn't know. This here is the iFixit Pro Tech Toolkit. Now, it's this canvas bag. You open it up with this Velcro strap. And you're like, OK, that's very exciting. What else is in there? Well, we have the thing that people never seem to buy themselves, which you really should. This is an anti-static wrist wrap. So if you work inside a computer, you know you should be wearing one of these to make sure you don't zap your components. This suction cup, if you ever worked on anything with a glass face, something like an iMac perhaps, when you're taking it apart, you can use the suction cup to take off that piece of glass. And there's all kinds of spudgers, which is fun to say all the time. So let's say we got my, this is my Galaxy S3, which fell off that roller coaster, folks. Yeah, it's still shattered, why? because I'm a lazy, lazy man. Uh, not only have we done a replacement of an S3 screen on know-how, but iFixit also has a fantastic teardown, an actual repair guide, how you can replace your actual screen and above the, the pictures, the images. So you can see that using a spudger to take out device, take this thing apart. Obviously, I have to glue this down so, or like tape it down so I don't get glass everywhere. But they also have like a parts list above all of those images. And so we have our spudgers to take it apart. We've got tweezers. And when I get something stuck somewhere else, I have this little grabby tool, which is excellent. Now, this is, this is also included a 54-bit driver kit. Now, not bit like in security, but bits this way. Now, why would you use this? It, this pretty much has every single bit you could think about. So if you have like an iPhone, and which has those pentalobe screws on the bottom, there's pentalobe, uh, pentalobe uh, bits here. There's also triangular ones, so let's say your kid's McDonald's toy is broken, you can actually fix it with this. Pretty much any driver you could think of is right here. And again, we've got all kinds of metal spudgers. Now, why you choose one over the other, the plastic one, you're more likely to not scratch a device. But if you've got something that you just need to pry apart, you've got these metal versions, stronger, very, very helpful. And again, if you've ever worked with an Apple product or any modern smartphone, you know this, these are the tools you're going to need to actually take apart one of those devices. With iFixit, you can fix it yourself. Visit ifixit.com slash twit for free step-by-step -step guides. iFixit also sells every part and tool you'll need. Plus, if you enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout, you'll save $10 off any purchase of $50 or more. That's ifixit.com slash twit. And we thank iFixit for coming on board with KNOWHOW because this is a marriage made in heaven, flat out. Like, I'm going to be using these tools to take, I gotta, I really gotta fix this thing. This is horrible. I'm gonna have an S3, even if, you know, at worst, you know what I'm gonna use this for? This is gonna be my new uh, Harmony remote control. Once I solve this problem, I'm gonna use these tools and have this done by next week, because this is, this is glass, it's dangerous. Anyway, let's go back to Father Robert, because I know he's around, he's got something to do with, I believe, hotspots and Windows 7 slash 8 devices. Hey, know-it-alls. This is Father Robert Balasser, the digital Jesuit. I'm here at Interop at the Javits Center in New York, one of the geekiest places on Earth, surrounded by a network that we built up. In fact, one of the most advanced temporary networks in the world. Now, our producer, Shannon, being the super genius that she is, decided that I should try to bring you a segment from the show that brought the networking knowledge down to the real guy, to, to you and me, the person who might actually use it who doesn't build big iron. And so this is what we came up with how to turn your Windows 7 and Windows 8 laptop 
into a hotspot. Now, where does this become handy? It becomes handy if you're at least a little bit like me, a person who travels a lot. I mean, I travel a lot, way too much actually. And in most of the hotels that I've stayed in, one thing is constant. That is, they have decent wired connection, but the wireless has been, we'll just call it funny. It's either a little slow, a little well, inconsistent, or more likely, I just don't trust it. I mean, when I'm transmitting my personal information, I don't want to go over a public wireless system because I know exactly how insecure that can be. But what happens when you travel with your laptop and your mobile phone or your tablet and they both want Wi-Fi access? Well, you could bite the bullet and use that public Wi-Fi or you can follow the little trick that I'm about to give you that will let you take this, put it into your laptop and share it with every other device that you have in your arsenal. Now, the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you have a laptop that has both a wired and a wireless adapter. You need two adapters because you need something to take in your connection and then something to share it out. To show you how this is going to work, you should first see what network adapters actually exist on your computer. Click Start, Control Panel, Network and Sharing Center, and Change Adapter Settings. Most likely you'll see two adapters, your Ethernet adapter and your wireless adapter. We want to share the connection from your Ethernet adapter to your wireless adapter, making it the hotspot. The first step is to create a CMD, a command icon on your desktop. Right click on the desktop, select New, then Shortcut, and in the field type CMD and hit Enter, then Finish. Now you can right click the icon and choose Run as Administrator. I give you this step because it's going to be a lot easier for us to do what we have to do to run NetSH as administrator if there is a command icon on the desktop. You just right click it and run it as administrator. Now NetSH is a fantastically useful program that's just hidden deep underneath layers of Windows 7 and Windows 8. I'm going to show you how to unleash the power of NetSH. When you choose Run as Administrator, you'll get a UAC warning asking you if you want the program to make changes to the computer. Go ahead and click Yes. Now type the following line into your administrative command prompt. Net sh wlan set hosted network mode equals allow ssid equals twit in quotation marks key equals twiat riot in quotation marks and hit enter. You can replace twit with the ssid of your choice and you can replace twiat riot with the key or passphrase of your choice. You'll get a confirmation that the hosted network mode has been set to allow, the SSID has been changed, and the key passphrase has been changed. Now go back into your network settings by clicking Start, Control Panel, Network and Sharing Center, Change Adapter Settings, and you should see the addition of a Microsoft Virtual Wi-Fi Mini Port Adapter. Right click on the icon of the adapter that is currently connected to the internet, which is most likely your Ethernet adapter. Then in the drop-down menu, select Properties. Choose the Sharing tab. Check the box next to Allow Other Network Users to Connect Through This Computer's Internet Connection. You'll now be able to select through which other network adapter you're going to share your Ethernet connection. You want to go ahead and choose the newly created Wi-Fi connection. The last step is to go back into your administrative command shell and type the command NetSH WLAN Start Hosted Network. That's it. Your Windows 7 or 8 laptop is now a Wi-Fi hotspot that you can share through any of your devices. Now, if it doesn't work the first time, don't fret. It may take a couple of restarts for the adapter to be recognized properly or for the settings to switch over. But eventually, you will get that hotspot signal with the SSID and key that you've specified. There are a few other things that you need to note. The first is that you don't need to repeat all these steps every time you want to turn on the hotspot. In fact, once you've created the adapter, the only command you need to worry about is that last NETS SH command. Every time you resume from standby or restart the computer, you'll have to right click that command icon, run as administrator, and then type NETSH WLAN start hosted network. Another note is that if you ever want to change the name or passphrase for your network, you don't have to delete everything and you don't have to repeat all the steps. All you have to do is retype that first command, netshwlan start hosted network 
mode equals allow, SSID equals whatever name you want, key equals whatever key you want, and then you hit enter. Now this is a pretty rudimentary trick, but it's amazing how much power is actually built into the command shell of Windows. It makes you wonder why Microsoft didn't just give us a couple of icons to build it into the UI, since it is such a useful feature. I find it especially useful when I'm on the road or international, and I need to be able to share my wired connection with the other people in my party. Something else I want to note with a little grin of mischievousness is that you can use this same command, net sh, if you ever wanted to run, say, a honeypot. Because while the device is connected to your hotspot, you could run Wireshark on your computer and see all the traffic that passes through. In fact, I won't say who, but I know someone who may have used one of those GoGo -Go airborne internet systems to have two wireless connections, one passing in and one sharing out, in order to be able to monitor everything that everyone on the plane does over GoGo. -Go. It's one of these wonderful little tidbits of Windows knowledge. I'm Father Robert, handing it back over to Ayaz in the studio, and uh, now you know. Well. Seems like somebody spends a lot of time in airports, and now anytime you see free public Wi-Fi, by the way, never hook into that. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the honeypot idea, that's mischievous. I do enjoy those kinds of tricks, which also means why I'll be reading lots of books, paper books, when I'm at the airport the next time, just because I don't want to necessarily be monitored by all of you know-it-alls, so that's going to be great. Uh, let's take another quick break and thank a sponsor, lynda.com. Uh, the more you know, the more you can succeed. Lynda.com is an online learning company that helps anyone learn creative software and business skills to achieve their personal and professional goals. With a Lynda.com subscription, members receive unlimited access to a vast library of high quality, current and engaging video tutorials across a wide variety of subjects. So for you guys, you know, you're watching Know How, you might be into Photoshop. It turns out that even our old friend, Bert Monroy, is doing some tutorials at, at lynda.com. If you want to learn Dreamweaver, you can have experts teach you that. Videography, audio recording. And if you just don't even know where to start with something like, like lynda.com, because there's so many options, well, lynda.com has curated playlists that highlight the most relevant courses you'll need to learn a particular topic, subject, or skill. You can learn WordPress, design and create a website, find a job even. They even have tutorials on how to negotiate for a raise, which is kind of cool. Create an animation, shoot video with your DSLR, learn to edit video and more. Now, currently, I am looking at a course called Video Journalism Storytelling Techniques. Now, a while back, I went ahead and I wanted to shoot a documentary. Now, I have no background in video journalism whatsoever. This course would have been really helpful if I wanted to actually be able to talk to the, the subjects in a intelligent way, because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't take video journalism in school, but lynda.com has awesome tutorials that when I try my next documentary project, which I'm not sure what I'm gonna do, but it might be about beer. When I do that, I'll be able to talk to my clients in a respectful manner. I'll know how to tell a better story because there's something about, you can learn it by doing, but you can also check out lynda.com so you can actually have trained professionals explaining to you how you can actually do this. And if that's not your cup of tea, don't worry about it. Over 2,000 courses with new courses being added daily. These instructors are working professionals at the top of their fields. Expert teachers are telling you what to do. A high quality video production, right? So you're not dealing with some YouTuber in his basement with really bad lighting and really bad audio. We can't understand what's going on. Lynda.com. These videos have fantastic production quality. There's curated course content. Each Lynda course is carefully structured so that users can learn from start to finish or jump to a specific chapter for quick answers. So if you want to jump around in these playlists, you can do that anytime you want to. You're not restricted. It's not like one long movie. It's a playlist. There are bookmarks and playlists, like I mentioned, to organize your courses into a customized learning path, tutorials at all levels. So if you're just a beginner, this will be great. If you're intermediate, they have that covered. If you're an expert, you could pick up even more tips. You can watch from your computer, tablet, or mobile device. This to me is fantastic because I'll start a course on my laptop, maybe at work, right after I'm done with work, take a look at something. But when I'm on the go, I can use my lynda.com app and I can actually pick up the video right there and pick up the course and watch it while I'm waiting in line at the bank. So I can learn a little bit extra as opposed to just sitting and waiting there and watching the back of the person's head in front of me. And you can also set the pace Learn what you want, when you want. 
Now, it's only $25 a month for access to Linda's entire course library. That's over 2,000 courses, and you get to access all of that for just 25 bucks a month. Or for $37.50 a month, you can subscribe to the premium plan, which includes exercise files that let you follow along with the instructor's project using the same assets that the instructors are using. Visit lynda.com slash know-how to access the entire library. That's over 2,000 courses free for seven days. That's lynda.com slash know-how. And we thank Linda for their support of know-how. <sighs> wow, so many things I should have known about my documentary and how to approach the, the uh, fine folks at the Petaluma Pie Company. But then like saying, hey, I want to do a documentary. Can I watch you guys? And they said, okay. It just so happened they, be, they are documentary makers themselves. So they understood my weirdness, uh, but I would have known much more if I used that course. Uh, let's move on to feedback. We got an email from Jim. He, he writes in saying, as of September 22nd, this Vimeo app no longer edits videos. I just downloaded it, and all it allows you to do is upload or view, no edits, no clips merging, nothing. Now, what Jim is talking about is a while ago, I showed you how to do video editing on an iPad, and I suggested, hey, let's use Vimeo, because it's free. That's fantastic, a free video editor, and it's from Vimeo, it's really powerful. It had some clunky moments, and it wasn't spectacular, but free is very hard to argue with. And so, with the iOS 7 update, the Vimeo app got an update, and they ripped out the editor. So that made me very, very, you know, sad faced. So what I would like you guys to do, since you guys are the know-it-alls, I'd like you guys to give us some ideas. If you can send us an email, knowhow at twit.tv, the best free video editor for iOS. That'd be fantastic, because I've got to go out there, I've got to go find something new to replace this, because when I updated my iPad, and now iOS 7 allows me to update everything with just one little button, and then the continuous updates, I lost the functionality. Rats. But iMovie still exists, so I can still use that. But free is free is free, and I like that. If you've got questions, comments, uh, you've got a, a show ideas, you could also send us an email at knowhow at twit.tv. There's also the option of Twitter. We always are taking a look at Twitter. If you use the hashtag twitkh, uh, send in your ideas, your questions, comments there too as well. And then there's my favorite, Google+. We have a Google Plus community of over 4,000 people. That's 4,000 people plus at Google Plus, gplus.to slash twitkh. That's the easiest way to find it. Or you can look up twit know-how on Google Plus and it'll show up because it's like plus.google.com slash user slash 10083, whatever. I don't know what it is. It's easier with this way. Over 4,000 of you guys with different show ideas, lots of comments. It's, it reminds me of the old school forums because folks are coming up with new projects and helping out each other right in public. So instead of it just going to the email inbox, everyone can see what's going on. I'm a big fan of using that. If for some reason you're like, hey, I watched the show and I have, I, I just, it was just too fast. What, what could I do? You go to twit.tv slash kh. I'll say it slower, twit.tv slash kh. Because we've got show notes for every single episode. Well, I think starting at episode five, including this one. So detailed show notes, so if you want to know what I was using to build that rig or what Padre was using to, to tap that, that network, that'll be up at twit.tv slash kh. Instructions, you get links. And if you want lots of projects, there's over 60 projects at this point, you can get those available at twit.tv slash kh. Available in glorious HD if you want to see this in HD. Maybe you want to make use of that television of yours. Go ahead, you can get the download version of that. And that pretty much wraps it up for us at know-how. We'll see everybody next week. And now that you know how, go do it.